Did y'all enjoy that? That was good. That was good. Y'all came to church today. Yeah, that was good. Well, listen, I, uh, I don't want to keep you too long today. I uh, wanted you to come sincerely, wanted you just to get some wind in your sails, because I sincerely believe that, that 2018 is going to be an incredible year at Graceway. Um, I, I really do. Um, I need you to understand the, the transition that just occurred after Pastor Jeff has been here uh, 439 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, man, churches just don't do that. And, and you all have been so gracious and so kind. But anytime that God sees fit to show up, there's a stewardship involved. And, uh, and, and I'm believing that we're going to step into that stewardship and that God's going to do his thing. And so I have just a, a, a quick word for you today, hopefully quick. We'll see how it goes. I'm going to do my best. Uh, but it's in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I know you just sat down, but we're going to stand up in gratitude to God's word. I'm going to pray. And then I just want to help you heading into this new year to the best of my ability. So let's read God's word together, and then we will pray and get to it. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be as slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. And she said, your servant has nothing in the house. Some of you feel that way today. Man, I don't got anything. God, nothing that God could use, nothing to give God, nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And he said, go outside and borrow some vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Make sure you don't get too few. Then go in, shut the door behind you and your sons and pour all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought vessels to her. And when the vessel was full, she said to her son, bring me another. And he said, there is not another. And the oil stopped flowing. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for a time to praise you. Thank you that you're a God who's worthy of praise. And God, we want to turn our eyes toward this next year, turn our eyes toward what you're doing in the next year and the belief that you're going to continue to build, continue to do, continue to renew and restore, continue to call people to your son. And God, we want to be a part of that. And so I just pray over these next few minutes that your Holy Spirit would uh, do his thing would speak to us, would convict us, would transform us, would lead us to involuntary worship on the spot, and that you'd be glorified. I love you, God, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So I, uh, on a pretty regular basis, will come during the week into this room, and it's, the lights are off, and, and it's quiet, and I'll put my headphones on, and uh, have my Bible, and I'll just kind of be in the stillness and in the quiet, and I stumble around and mumble around and pray and read and all that kind of thing. And, and shortly into me being here, I came across this text in my one-year Bible plan. And it's an interesting story because it's of a, a new widow with two sons. She's in over her head, has more month than money. And uh, she calls to the man of God and says, you knew who my husband was. You knew that he feared God. But I got creditors. Uh, the bank's coming to take my boys I need you to do something. And Elisha says, man, what, what do you want me to do? And she says, I don't really have anything to, to give to you to be used by God uh, except for this one jar of oil. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go door to door in your neighborhood, and I want you to say, do you have any empty vessels? And I want you to get all those vessels. I want you to put them in the room. I want you to close the door. I want you to call out to God, and I want us to see what God will do. And so she begins to pour that initial bottle into another empty vessel, and it fills up. And she goes to the next, and it fills up. And she goes to the next, and it fills up. And the next, and it fills up. And you have to understand this. Listen, the, the level of poverty, the level of desperation, the level of, God, I got to have you show up right now is so incredibly high. And she pours the first, and, and that anxiety and, and that fear begins to turn to shock and awe, right? And then it begins to turn to just joy, and she's crying, and she's slobbering, and she's looking at her boys, and they're hugging each other, and God has showed up, and it's an incredible, incredible story. Here's the thing, though. There comes this point. Let's say that they fill up 10 or 12 or 20 or 30. I don't know how many, but there comes this point at which she says, give me another bottle, and the boys say, they're in another bottle, and what happens to the oil? It stops. And I'm walking around in here, and I'm thinking about this church, and I'm thinking about what I believe God wants to do, and this thought comes to my mind of, 
I wonder if there are things that God wants to fill up at Graceway, but we haven't given him an empty vessel to do it. I wonder if there's things that God wants to do in you, but you only got two bottles and they're mostly full. And this fear came over me, if I'm completely honest with you, of God, don't let Graceway get to a spot where we're looking into the past, and don't let Graceway get to a spot where we come to you with three bottles when you wanted to give us 30. This year, I'm going to turn 40 years old. Come on, somebody. 40 years old. I am a mostly full-grown adult male doing my best. I'm working on it. And God brought me, I believe, to, to Graceway. Um, man, I got crying, praying about it in the first service. Just, uh, sometime I'll tell you the story, but just the train of events that landed us here and the, the clarity and the specific answers to prayer. And, I, and I'm following such a good man, Pastor Jeff who's been here for such a long time, and God has used, and I'm grateful for that, but I also feel the stewardship of that. And I started to think to myself, God, what would it look like for me to, to be growing in my capacity and have the longevity that I could be at Graceway for a long period of time, but full throttle the whole time? You understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't want to crash into the finish line, and I don't want to get to a, a season or an age in my life. I understand trials, suffering, valley of death. I get all of that, but I don't want to get to a time in my life where because I didn't steward my life well, I've only got a couple of bottles when God wanted to give me 20. And so I started to just think through, I started talking to my counselors, started talking to my coaches, started talking to some of the pastors on staff about this idea, this what does it look like to have capacity and to grow in capacity and have your capacity be used for God's glory and the blessing of others. And me looking at what would it look like for me to be as well as I can possibly be. And if, look, if God sees fit, to take me home or to come back, I'm down. I just don't want to be the one that preempts it. You tracking with me? And so what I want to say to you today is that I believe that there is capacity to be had at Graceway. I do. I believe that there's capacity to be had in your life. And you say, man, you don't even know me. I, I honestly don't need to know you because what I know is that if that lady would have had another vessel, God would have had the oil to fill it. God never says, oh man, I thought they were going to bring 12 and they brought 14. God always has more. God always has fresh. God always has oil. God always has outpouring that he can give to us. The question is, is my life in a place, is my capacity such that I'm, I'm matching the favor of God with the capacity of my life? And so here's the, the statement that I want to say to you. Your capacity, listen, it's not in your grand ideas. Your capacity isn't in the most innovative thing about it. Your capacity is in your habits. Your capacity is in your habits. You show me somebody with a certain kind of habit, and I'll show you somebody with a certain kind of capacity. Let me give you some examples. Stephen King, Ernest Hemingway, and Charles Dickens. Have you heard of these guys? Yeah. yeah. Do you know what they woke up and did every single morning? They wrote. Every single morning. They get up somewhere between 5 and 9 a.m., and they would write for between 4 and 6 hours every day. We think, those guys are geniuses. No, they were diligent. They were diligent. They had a habit that they believed they had a vision for. Winston Churchill read one hour every night of his life. Bill Hybels, who pastors or did pastor one of the largest churches in the country, doesn't matter what, what you think about the church, half an hour every night for 40 years read, investing in a habit. Beethoven composed 7 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. every single day. And it actually says that when he would get tired of playing, like my brother here, right? Woo -woo -woo, his arms are He would take a walk and think about what he was composing for the sake of going back to create and compose. Pablo Picasso painted every day at 2 p.m. because of what he was doing the night before, I assume, right? And would paint from 2 to 10. You look at these guys and you say, man, this, I mean, unbelievable genius. The genius was in the habit. And you take somebody's gifts and talents, which everybody in this room has, and you match it to a habit, and it has an exponential effect. Larry Bird and Steph Curry have one thing in common. They both took 500 shots every single day. You say, man, that brother can shoot. Or that white boy can shoot. Come on, somebody. A white boy that can shoot and dunk if he had a free pass to the, to the yeah. 500 shots a day. You say, how do you make that shot? 500 shots every day. I have a friend, he has a daughter who went to Yale. She has a master's degree in art. She's a professional artist, meaning she gets paid. Some of y'all are art artists, but you're not professional artists. You know what I'm saying? 
she, she is a professional artist, has, has a studio, and is an incredible one. And I, I went to coffee with her, and I said, tell me about your process. And she said, I sit down, and I write out an equation. I said, what, what does that mean? And she says, I'll, I'll say two rights and a left, and then a U and a W, and then a squiggly thing, and then another right and a left, and then I just follow my rule. I said, why, why do you do it that way? I mean, that sounds more like math. And she goes, that's what most people think, but the truth is that art without boundaries is chaos. Some of you guys, God called you to live an, an, an artful life, but you have a chaotic life. Can I tell you why? Because you don't have any habits, because in habit means I say no to something. A habit means that I wake up and I write for four hours. Why? Because I'm a writer. And I do it every day. And some days I wake up and I'm like, it's not coming to me, but I, I'm diligent. And in the diligence and in the habit, what happens? My capacity is expanded. One of those days, Hemingway wrote, all quiet, or, or uh, what? The sun, ah, shoot, you know what I'm talking about. My brain went... I've read a ton of Hemingway, and no title is coming to my mind right now. Somebody help me out. What's a Hemingway title? There you go. That one. <laughs> he wrote that some Tuesday morning, right? Dickens, The Christmas Carol, some Thursday morning. Steph Curry, NBA Finals. No, in the gym by himself, unfortunately, at the Cavs' expense, all right? But genius tends to happen. Capacity tends to be expanded when you have a diligent habit connected to it. Now, here's the thing about the, your habit. I don't want you to depend on your motivation. I've noticed something that uh, most people, when you say, you got a New Year's resolution, more and more, it used to be that everybody had one, but more and more now, what do we say? My resolution is to not have a resolution. <laughs> yeah, that's not a thing. But um, what is a resolution? Think about this. It is to resolve, to be resolute. Could, could our world stand a little bit more resolved human beings? Yeah, of course it could. But you don't want to depend on your motivation. The reason you don't like your motivation is because you and I don't like to say we're going to do something and then fail. So here's what I want to say to you. This habit, don't depend on your motivation to do it. A habit is something that I just get up and do whether I like it or not. And in order for me to do that, I don't have to have motivation. I have to have a vision. Listen to me. Do you have a vision for God to use your life in 2018? Be careful how you answer. Do you have a vision to leave a mark on somebody in your neighborhood? Do you have a vision to be a light at work? Do you have a vision to invest in your family? Do you have a, do you have a vision or do you just have an idea? Do you just have a, it would be great if? Listen, Charles Dickens got up and he had a vision to write several masterpieces. So he got up every morning and he wrote whether he felt like it or not. You and I would like to lose 15 pounds and you go to the gym for a month and a half in your weird pants and baggy shirt, right? And what happens? That, we don't have a vision for it. And so here's what I want to, to, to try to put some wind into your sails around. Listen, God has a vision for your 2018. God has capacity that he wants. God has an outpouring that he wants to give. The question is whether or not you have enough vessels to receive what God has for you. And the way that you're going to expand your capacity, your vessels, is to pick a habit. A habit. You say, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Let me read you 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race, all the race runners run, but only one receives the prize? All right? So run that you might obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. I got a vision, a vision of me winning. And so what do I do? I say no to some things. I have habits that other people don't have. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul says, I, I want to make sure that I don't stumble into the finish line. I want to make sure that I don't miss the things that God has for me. I want to make sure that my 2018, as it were, is as full as God wants it to be. I'm not going to stand in the way of that. I'm going to let it be. I'm going to let it be. And so what I want to do is I just want to be a good pastor to you. I want to help you with how this works. Because if resolutions were easy, we would have all done it. If habits were easy, we would have all done it. And so what I want to ask you to do is I want to ask you to just pick one habit. Please don't pick 10 habits. If you pick 10, you pick zero. Okay, I don't want you to say, my habit is going to be that I'm going to read the Bible every day, all of it. And I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give all my, don't, just 
One simple habit. Let me give you some examples. Some of you, you need to pick a faith habit. The capacity that you need to grow in to receive what God has for you is simply your knowledge of and enjoyment of God. And some of you, you need to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, on this side of 2018, I'm going to pick a Bible reading plan. Uh, Pastor Jeff uses the McShane Bible reading plan. I use the one-year Bible. Every morning, I get up and I try to hear from God. Can I tell you something? It doesn't always work. Sometimes it's robotic. Sometimes it's like, it's dry. Sometimes it's like, Man, my prayers are hitting the ceiling. But do you know what I do the next day? I get up and I try it again. I get up and I try it again. Some of you, you need to say, man, this year is the year that I'm going to grow as a a prayer. This is the year that I'm going to call out to God. This is the year that I'm going to every single day pray these certain things in the belief that God is a God who hears and answers and acts. If I continue to knock and continue to ask, God will talk back to me. And so I'm going to create a faith habit. Some of you need to grow in generosity. Some of you, honestly, you let the bucket pass, and you need to go out and you say, I'm not going to go into a new year without generosity. Now, here's the thing. You say, yeah, preachers are always talking about it. Look, this ain't about me. This has nothing to do with me. I'm not concerned that if you don't give, God won't provide for me. Okay? What I'm concerned about is that in America, one of the most vicious strongholds in our lives is the God of money and everything that we think comes with it. And so we need to have a habit that is not, I'm going to choose to have the motivation to every two weeks write a check. Nope. Put it on automatic withdrawal. Because what's going to happen? You're going to have that month. You know what I'm talking about? That month. And you're going to say, nah, I'm not going to do, I don't, I don't feel the motivation. I don't have a vision to grow in that. And so I'm going to respond instead of having a vision and you're not going to do it. Some of you need to grow in gratitude. Gratitude. You know, we were talking that Isaac said, how many of y'all are looking, for, looking forward, thanking God for 2018? And look, I know you're in church, and I know that you know the right answer, but some of you are like, not me. 2017 was bad, man. I don't need a double dose of that. And the enemy wants to say, look at all of the things that went wrong instead of all of the grace that God provided. And so you got to wake up listen, I'm not a morning person, then do it at night, okay? I'm not a night person, then do it at lunch. Figure out a way to expand your capacity. Why? Because God wants to pour out his favor and his blessing on your life. And because I don't want you to miss out on that opportunity, some of you, you need to pick a health habit. Say, here we go. I knew we were going here. So let me just be a good pastor to you, okay? Some of us, we intellectually believe that God has a calling on our lives, but we treat our physical body as though it's a short-term agreement. Listen, what, what if the most fruitful years of your life are in your 50s and you're 30? What if the most fruitful years of your life are in your 80s? I don't know why that would be, but I want you to get there, and I want you to get there well, and I want, to get you, I want you to get there of sound mind and of sound body. Why? So you can invest so that you can pour out what's been poured in. And some of you, you just need to say, man, uh, enough, enough. I'm going to be healthy as long as God lets me, but I'm going to do my part. Okay? Some of us, we need to make decisions around our finances. Not motivational decisions, habits. This is the budget. This is when I give. This is how much. This, it's automated. Why? Because God gave it to you, and you're a steward of it. God didn't give it to you to spend only. He gave it to you to steward as well. Some of you need to work on your family. Can I tell you something? The reason you feel disconnected from your wife is because you haven't sat across the table from her in four and a half months. Just the two of you. Call it whatever you want. Call it a date. Call it a lunch. Call it a business meeting. I don't care. But what day of the week are you sitting across from your spouse and it's just the two of you? and you're having an adult conversation, right? Maybe you're arguing, maybe you're planning, maybe you're casting vision, maybe you're listening. I don't know what it is. Maybe you need to have a daddy date. You say, I got 10 kids, one a week, all right? (laughs) Just, my kids are all right, but I love my wife. Come on, somebody, (laughs) 10 kids. Listen, don't pick a habit. 
to expand your capacity. Can I tell you that when, when we commit one of those things to God, God responds exponentially. When I say, God, I want to be as well as I can for as long as I can because I believe you want to use me, I'll give, I can give you this thing. God will take that and make that exponential. He'll make that exponential. You are running a race. You are fighting a war. You are called to a good work, to a vocation that God says, walk worthy of the vocation that God has called you to. Pick a habit. Pick a habit. So let me help you with this. Let me be as practical as I can. There are three R's that I want to put in front of you. Three R's that I want to put in front of you around the habit that you want to pick. Some of you, you immediately know what it is. But let me tell you how to execute this in a way that will make, you'll make it to March. Okay? Are you good? Yeah. You're awfully quiet today. You're in church. You're supposed to be talking back. Come on. Here we go. Be proactive. Number one, the first step to it is if you pick your habit, you need a reminder. You need a reminder. And that reminder needs to involve a couple things. You need to tell somebody what your thing is. Not ask somebody, tell somebody what your thing is, and then use technology and that community to make sure it happens. Here's how it works. Pastor Jeff, his Twitter feed is full of 140 characters of what he read in the Bible that morning. Does anybody know why he does that? He does that because if you look at his Twitter feed and go, you didn't read your Bible on Tuesday. That's why he does it. He doesn't do that for him. He does that for the built-in accountability. Okay? I've already told my counselor the days that I'm going to meet with him. I've already told Pastor John what I'm going to read. I gave him my reading list because I want the accountability, because I want the reminder, because I know that there are going to be days that I wake up and go, I don't want to do that, but I don't want to tell Pastor John. And so you need to find somebody. You need to let God's people come alongside you. You need to have your phone bing and bong and yell and scream and explode and light on fire, whatever it is, so that you take a step into an increased capacity. Number two, you need a routine. You need a routine. You need to pick a day, a time, and a place. What's the days that you're going to read God's word? What time and where? In my house, not specific enough. What time? Uh, in the morning, not specific enough. I'm going to read my Bible every morning at 6 a.m. in my bed, not in my bed, in a chair beside my bed, right? And I need to tell somebody when that is, and I need to give them permission because I know that my motivation is eventually going to fail. And because I want to have, be used, I want to have a vision to be used by God in 2018. I have a vision to be growing in my capacity so that God can pour out whatever he wants. And then number three, you need a reward, okay? My wife and I, we just did the whole 30. I lost 16 pounds, okay? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's a little embarrassing because I was like, doggone it. That, I weighed way more than I did. But do you know what we did over Christmas? We ate like we were losing our salvation over it. <laughs> like it was running from us. Do you know how many times I thought to myself while I was saying, I can't eat that? I thought to myself, Christmas Eve, I'm going to kill that. <laughs> Listen, what are you, you going to do to celebrate? What are you going to do to celebrate? How are, you, how are you going to say, we prayed and God answered our prayer? What's the check-in? I didn't eat, but now I can. I read and God said this. I'm working out and I lost this amount of time. I spent this time with my little boy or this time with my spouse. And what's the check-in? What's the celebration? What's the thank you, God, for expanding my capacity? Can I tell you, if you lose any one of those R's, your, your habit's not going to work. Because everything in your life is built toward chaos, isn't it? It's built toward you reacting. It's built toward you responding all over. And what, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to, to pick a resolution. I'm asking you to have a vision to be used by God in 2018. And I'm asking you to say no to some things so that God can increase your capacity, so that God can be more glorified in your life, so that your life in this place can be more full. Do you, do you believe that he can do that today? Do you believe that he wants to do that today? Then I'm asking you to have a plan to do it. I'm asking you to have a vision to do it, and I'm asking you to let this church come alongside you so at the end of 2018 we can say, look at what God did. Look at all the fruit. Look at all the glory. Look at all the grace. Look at all the transformation. Look at all the renewal. And we'll stand on this stage, and hopefully Isaac will come back, and you'll be sitting in your chair bawling your eyes out because you know the increase that God gave you, and you're going to know that only God did it. Amen? All right, stand up. 
I want to just get a couple things on your radar that are coming up that we're excited about. We've been working hard over the holiday. Next week, we are going to do a one day of the book of Hosea, okay? Outside of the book of Revelation, there is not a crazier book in the Bible than the book of Hosea. If you get some time to read it this week, make sure that you do. But the book of Hosea this next Sunday is going to be awesome. January 12th and 13th, we're going to do a marriage conference. You say, I'm not married. Do you want to be married? Yes, I do. Then you should come, all right? Um, here's what that's going to look like. Let me just real quickly uh, get this. I need Friday night and Saturday morning. Friday night, we're going to do one session, and then we're going to do an after party. We're going to get some food. We're going to have a lot of fun, have some games. Uh, husbands against wives. Have you ever seen a husband and a wife compete for anything? It is violent, all right? And it's going to be awesome. Uh, come back the next morning. We're going to have breakfast. I'm going to have a Q&A panel of uh, couples, different ages, different cultures, answering all the questions that you have. And then my pastor, Dr. Perry, and his wife, Dr. Cynthia, are going to do a session on the pursuit of oneness in marriage, having been married about 40 years. Would that be helpful to you? So we want to we wanna come alongside you in that way. And then Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day is the 15th, but on the 14th, my pastor is going to be preaching. We are going to honor Dr. King's life by making much of his Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? And I asked him to speak about what does it look like to live in gospel unity in a world gone to you know where. And so that's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss that. Then we're going to head into the book of Esther until Easter. And I'm excited about all that. So I'm believing for big things, praying for big things, trying to create habits in the understanding that God wants to use this church. I hope you'll join me. Okay? Yeah. Let's pray. God, I love these people. Thank you for them. Thank you for your grace to me and allowing me to be a part of it. God, whatever 2017 has been, we're, we are looking into the future. We are looking with vision and hope and faith and belief to pick a habit to increase our capacity to be more deeply, more significantly used by you. And so, God, would you do what only you can do? Would you use this as only you can use us? And God, we're believing and we're going to give you thanks that at the end of 2018, we're going to say, look at what God did. So thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the worship we're about to sing. We love you today and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.